sorry. So um, I'm going to talk about management of the failing kineal graft, looking at more the immunological side. Um, at the end of this talk, hopefully you'll have brought home a couple of uh, messages. Um, I hope that by the end of the talk, you have recognized that, as David said, these people who um, are transplanted long term, long term and whose kidney function is failing, um, they're a very high risk population and a unique population. I hope to be able to explain more about that today. Um, there is many causes of deterioration in graft function and I'm just going to focus mainly on the immunological side today because my, the next speaker is going to um, talk a little bit more about the other aspects of the failing graft um, and throughout the day you'll hear different aspects about that. And also I'm going to talk a little bit about management of uh, and the approach to somebody who has a failing graft. I don't want to be negative today because transplantation is um, very beneficial to the majority of people with end-stage renal disease and it's the, it's the gold standard for renal replacement treatment for the majority of people with end-stage renal disease. So we're talking about a failing graft today. Um, I'm going to, in my next couple of slides, tell you about the frequency of that. But it's important to always remember that the benefit of kidney transplantation, this slide is familiar to a lot of people. Um, we keep putting it up all the time because it is very important to realize that um, if, you, if you look here at people who are on the wait list for transplantation on, on the horizontal line with, uh, with the risk of death here, Initially, at the time of transplantation, there is an increased risk of death compared to those in the waiting, uh, waiting list. But then by about three months, the, that risk is equalized. And it's very shortly afterwards and from then onwards, the survival benefit of transplantation remains. So that's important to keep in, in, uh, to keep in mind. So how many people have a failing graft? Um, in order to be able to explain this, it's, we, we look at it from how, what, is the page, what is the survival of a kidney. So here in BC, between 2006 and 2015, you can see the, survi the, uh, the survival rates. And this is divided into living, deceased donation, and stratified by age groups. If you look here at five years, you can see that the, the average survival is in around 90%, and similarly with deceased donation. And in fact, this is a little bit higher than the national average. So this is the national average of the same time period, the same uh, stratified in the same manner. And there's a slight increase in BC numbers. So that's very reassuring. So if you think five years, 90%, on average, 90% or more of patients ha are surviving, that is a very good survival um, rate. However, uh, we're doing more transplants. Transplant patients are living longer, so transplants are failing, and we want to be able to manage those appropriately. So if you look at US um, uh, rates, about 5% of dialysis starts are people who have failing grafts. And this is almost the fifth largest cause of, a of starting dialysis, secondary diabetes, hypertension, glomerulonephritis, and cystic disease. Um, so, what are, what are the risk factors for getting a failing graft? And again, we look at BC numbers. So you can divide a, a failure of a graft into those who die with a functioning graft and those who have a failing graft without dying. Um, so mortality is a big factor in, uh, in, in those who are failing. There's an increased risk of mortality. There's also non-immune risks and cardiovascular risks. I'm not gonna go into those because they'll be talked about later. But to, I'm just gonna focus a little bit on mortality because this is important to remember when you're dealing with these patients. So here you can see um, patient survival of a person who is a functioning transplant. And it's much higher than those patients who are returning to dialysis with a failed transplant. If you look at the five-year mark, the patient survival with a functioning transplant is about 90%. It's only about 65% in those who are returning to transplant. And this is significant. Um, another way of looking at it here, if you look at two-year mortality, the, those with a deceased donor transplant, these people are all the same age. 
uh, with a deceased donor transplant that is functioning, their mortality at two years is only about 6%, compared to 20% if, if it's a patient on dialysis with no transplant with the same age, compared to 25% in a patient who has a transplant that failed and is back on dialysis. So mortality is a big issue. Um, Colleen spoke earlier about various transitions. So if you think of the career of a CKD patient, dialysis patient, transplant patient, throughout its career and the different transitions, there's different rates of mortality during that time. And this is a study that, that John Gill did several years ago, looking at this mortality rate over time. Yes. Here is um, the, when the person is on the waiting list waiting for a transplant. So the longer somebody is on the waiting list, the higher the mortality rate. Um, at the time of transplant, there is a spike in the risk of mortality, which we saw from the previous slide. But once a patient is, is uh, transplanted, within, within probably six months, that mortality rate has significantly reduced. But again, at the time of transplant failure, there is a huge spike in mortality. And this is actually much, much bigger than when they were transplanted the first time. So this is important to remember that at the end of life, at the end of a kidney graft life, there is a huge increase in mortality. So what I was asked to talk about was the causes and the management of, of these patients. So what are the causes of a failing graft? Well, again, we look at BC. And in BC, in the last 10 years, um, about 30, uh, nearly 40% of patients died with a functioning graft. So the graft was fine, but they died from other causes. Um, and over 60% of patients uh, had a, uh, were, were fine, but the graft actually, actually died. So we call this, we call this death sensor graft loss. So we're, we're removing the people who died with a functioning graft. And here, this is death with a functioning graft. So you'd hear those terms throughout the talk. So if we remove this 38%, because I'm not going to talk about the various causes of mortality in these people, because that will come up later on the day, I want to concentrate more on the causes of the death sense of graft loss. So if we take away that 38%, then this is what we're left with. We're left with the causes of death sense of graft loss. So the terminology that patients are categorized uh, with when they lose their graft um, they're, they're a little bit antiquated and we need to, we need to change those. But 27% of patients who have death sense of graft loss lose their graft from what, for, from what we call chronic allograft nephropathy. This is an old fashioned umbrella term for chronic changes that happen in a graft due to immunological reasons. 7.5% were documented to, to lose a graft from acute rejection. Then there's, a, then there's these two blocks. So 16% had other causes, and 26% had unknown. So a quarter of the people who lost their graft, we don't know how they lost their graft. But we do know that within these two groups, a large proportion lost their graft from immunological reasons. So we could say that over 50 to 60% of patients who lost their graft from BC were, was from uh, immunological reasons, you know, when you, when you take out all those people who died with a functioning graft. Um, the same is true in other centers. So this is a study by the Alberta group, and um, it looked at uh, protocol biopsies, uh, or not protocol biopsies, but biopsies for cause in patients, in over 300 patients from Wisconsin, Alberta, um, and Illinois. And they looked at the, the causes of, uh, of, of uh, transplant failure in those groups. And it found that 50% had antibody-mediated rejection, and 5% had mixed rejection, and then there was a probability of rejection in 9%. So this means that well over 60% of patients had immunological cause of graft failure. And this group also found that almost 50% of these people were non-adherent. So that's interesting as well, and it's something I'll talk about in a few minutes. So, um, in several years ago, the, the dogma was that uh, graft failure was mainly a T-cell mediated process. At the moment, and even more so very recently, we now know that it's probably more an effect of the humoral arm of the immune system that's causing 
um, caused by immunosuppression regimens that's causing this uh, immunological failure. Um, so our dogma is changing, and with more and more studies coming out, we're getting more information about the mechanisms that are involved. So when a, um, when a transplant is uh, from, when a transplant from a donor with a different genetic makeup is put into a recipient, then there's a possibility that the recipient will form anti-HLA antibodies to that donor. And we call this donor, uh, de novo uh, donor-specific antibody formation. So these are antibodies that for, are formed after transplantation, so de novo after transplantation by the recipient to the donor HLA. I have outlined here the actual mechanisms. I'm not going to go into this in much detail, but it's activation of T cells, which in turn activate B cells, um, which activate plasma cells to produce these antibodies. Now, there's these anti-HLA antibodies, to, which are donor-specific, are directly associated with antibody, acute and chronic antibody-mediated rejection, and subsequently graft loss particularly class two um, anti-HLA antibodies and, a combina and if the person has a combination of class one, class two um, and particularly DQ antibodies are associated with uh, antibody mediated rejection. Um, so what do they do and how do they cause this? This is a very busy slide, but it's, it's really taking you through um, the proposed um, changes that happen to a graft with these uh, immunological damage. So at the time of transplant, everything is fine. Then very early on, there may be some inflammatory insult that happens to the kidney, which activates T cells. And in the background, there's a lot going on without any change in the creatinine or any clinical evidence of dysfunction. And during this time, de novo DSAs, or donor-specific antibodies, may be forming. Um, in turn, so in this box here is subclinical injury. So this is injury that's happening without any change in the creatinine or proteinuria or any, anything from the clinic side that you might think is going on. So there might actually be, be capillaritis going on or C4D positivity, negativity, positivity, which will wax and wane. And once you get more serious injury, then you see some changes in the clinical side and we call this clinical dysfunction. And when that progresses even further, without any treatment or intervention, then there's graft loss. So this is a, a summary of what is anticipated to be happening immunologically with uh, immunologically um, graft failure. So there's a lot of strategies, and we talk more about that, but matching class two has been proposed. Early, of course, uh, treatment of any type of rejection and adherence is a big thing, and again, I'll talk about that in a minute. This is, again, from the Alberta group, and it's actually, I know it looks like a really busy slide, but it's, it's actually a, um, it's a good exercise, and it looks at the probability of getting any uh, problem from the time of, tra any immunological problem from the time of transplant. Now, here in the green line, and this is the time of transplant, and these are uh, days post-transplant along here, there's no problem initially. The chances of, any, of no problem is very high. And then with time, particularly kind of around the, the three to six month period, there's, there's an increased chance of rejection, T cell rejection, polyomavirus. And then when you go out further, the there's a much higher increase of antibody mediated rejection. And here, way out, you can see atrophy, these are the chronic, um, these are the histological chronic features of, um, of repeated injury. Um, glomerular nephritis, it can happen early. So recurrence of glomerular nephritis can happen early. If it's de novo glomerulitis or glomerular nephritis, it can happen later. And all of these were associated with um, non-adherence in that study. So what are the things that impact the production of these uh, don uh, um, de novo donor-specific antibodies? So the, one of the main ones that we know is inadequate immunosuppression. Um, so we use a lot of immunosuppression, particularly in initially at the time of transplantation, but we have to 
we have to um, tailor immune suppression at various times due to various things like viral infections, intolerance to immune suppression, neutropenia, et cetera, and you know all those reasons. So patients themselves alter their immune suppression by not taking them. So that's called non-adherence. And unintentionally, uh, they may forget to take their medications. And oftentimes they don't know the importance that that has on their graft long term when it's a repeated event. Um, so de novo antibodies can form when we do have viral infections where we have to reduce immunosuppression in order to stop replication of viral infections. And this um, mainly incorporates CMV and polyomavirus. Autoimmunity also can happen. And this is angiotensin uh, one receptor antibody, which can in itself cause a rejection. Um, I mentioned uh, the class two antibodies and with mismatches. So what I mean by mismatch is that there, is, um, there isn't uh, a match between the donor and recipient for those HLA and therefore the recipient can form antibodies to the donor's uh, class two HLA. Transplant nephrectomy, and I've done some work on this, research on this a few years ago, is associated also with formation of DSAs. At the time of transplant nephrectomy, the vogue is to stop the immune suppression medication because it's a, it's a mechanism to be able to stop immune suppression. However, more and more information is coming out that uh, this has to be a slower process because DSAs form with the immediate um, uh, cessation of, of immune suppression at the time of transplant nephrectomy. Um, so uh, different clinical phenotypes and DSAs, DSA status are associated with de uh, death uh, sensitive graft survival. If you, um, if you look here um, at the red line, so this is survival here on this line, so 100% survival is here. So if you don't have any clinical dysfunction and you've no DSA, your survival is unchanged. But if you have clinical dysfunction and DSA, your survival is significantly reduced compared to any of the others with dysfunction or no DSA. So DSAs are bad. Um, subclinical antibody mediated rejection has also an increased risk of graft loss compared to subclinical T cell rejection. So when I, again, when I say subclinical, the patient isn't demonstrating any change in their creatinine or proteinuria, but these, these are um, detected by protocol biopsies, which are uh, scheduled biopsies that take place at various points post-transplantation. So this Paris group, they do protocol biopsies at their center, so they're able to get this information. So they have found that patients who have antibody-mediated rejection detected when the patient doesn't have any symptoms, um, are changing their creatinine, this has an effect on, on graft survival. And, they, and it's an independent risk factor uh, with a hazard ratio of 2.9, so almost threefold increased. Um, DSAs themselves are an increased risk factor for graft loss, for death sensor graft loss. And this is shown here, this, the um, solid line is when there's no DSA and the dotted line is when there is DSA. This is an interesting study, and it looks at um, the atherosclerosis in the, in the kidney transplant um, and changes that are accelerated or not within the first year of transplantation in, in people who have and haven't uh, DSAs. So if you look at the red line here, this is the expected increase over time or increase in age, uh, in atherosclerosis with age of the donor. This is the donor age here. So at the age of 60, you would expect this amount of um, atherosclerosis in the kidney. However, if you uh, transplant the kidney, then you have an expected increased, ra increased rate of atherosclerosis, but it's still within the range. These dotted lines here are the range of the normal donor. However, if you have DSA, this is, is escalated significantly. So the, um, there is an escalation in, um, cardio, in the atherosclerotic uh, deterioration within the kidney. So even outside the kidney, there is um, an increased risk of major adverse cardiac events if the patient has, is DSA positive as well by the first year post-transplant. So this is very significant and more will be talked about this later um, in the cardiovascular session. Now, non-adherence, this is huge. 
Um, and in the last five to ten years, we're recognizing more and more how important adherence is to a patient. The non-adherence itself is independently associated with DSA de development. Um, here, this is, the, this is the Winnipeg group, and they have shown that um, non-adherence is compared to those who are adherent is associated uh, with the instance of um, a DSA development. Now, how do we quantify um, uh, adherence and then uh, show that that's the cause of um, uh, the failing of the graft? There's, there's many ways. So if you look at a patient and uh, you examine the variability in their tacrolimus levels, so that's intra-patient variability, and you divide that into low variability, which means that they're pretty consistent and they're pretty diligent with taking it, versus medium versus high variability, which means that they're not taking it, then they're taking it, and it goes high because they have been dosed up because people think their levels are low. So if there's high variability, you can see here, if there's high variability, it's associated with a higher chronicity score within the kidney. Another way of looking at it is looking at coefficient of variation, which again shows variation in TAC levels. And the, the number that's uh, used in, in clinical studies is a coefficient of variation greater than 30%. And this coefficient of variation is associated with DSA formation also. So you can see here DSA uh, development um, with the black line representing those with coefficient greater than 30%, so greater, you know, with a lot of variability in their TAC levels versus those who have less than 30% here. So how do we manage these people? So it's very complex because the management involves both immunological management, management of CKD, management of their comorbidities. I'm going to focus more on the management of, from the immunological side. So um, we, can, we can generate pathways uh, for management. Here is a very simplistic pathway um, where you have deteriorating or increased serum creatinine. Um, you want to exclude certain um, acute causes for that, like dehydration, hypertension, nephrotoxins. You repeat the creatinine. If it's still high, you're also checking their CNI levels. If that's high, you adjust. And if it's persistently high, and this all happens within a very quick period of time. We don't wait around and wait a week or whatever. So if the creatinine is high, we do all of this pretty quickly. If the creatinine is still high, then we think of various things. The first thing in our mind is always, does this patient have rejection? So we, there's only one way of finding out, and we need to biopsy the patient. You want to know if they're compliant. That may have influenced if they have rejection or not. So the one way to find out if they have rejection or if they have recurrence of disease or whatever is to do a, a kidney biopsy. You also want to rule out obstruction. This may happen more in... The first within the first year of transplant, an ultrasound when they're getting their biopsy will outrule that. So everything kind of happens in, in one space. Also, with recurrence of disease, you may be more inclined to think they may have recurrence of disease if they have a lot of proteinuria or hematuria. Um, again, that will be seen by a biopsy. If you're suspicious of rejection, we usually start treating the patient even when we're doing the biopsy. So we treat with steroids initially. Everything has to be done quickly because we don't want any damage to the kidney. Um, at the same time, um, when you get the biopsy back and, it, and, and you find out what if there's rejection there, you want to send off DSAs to see, have they developed donor-specific antibodies to their donor? Because if so, they may be actually transitioning to developing anti antibody-mediated rejection. This is just an outline, and everybody has their, has their own pathway. Um, but uh, it's much more complex than that. When we look at the uh, immunological approach, prevention is huge. So we want to prevent this from happening because once DSAs have formed, it's hard to get rid of them. And they're, all, they're doing damage in the background all the time. So early, early intervention is crucial. By waiting and by you know, contemplating on what needs to be done and do we need to do a biopsy or not, that 
causes damage and damage can happen. So early, I mean, at the very time of transplant, we need to figure out what is the best immunosuppression to place this person on initially. What induction do we use? What's the best CNI to use? What's the best anti-metabolite to use? And that's how we formed our protocol for immunosuppression, because from the very beginning, we wanted to give this kidney the best chance. So, um, I've, I've, and I've said this here, so what do we know about the risk of individual immunosuppression agents and their ability to prevent DSA production? And then what do we need to do in order to uh, maintain adherence? So um, Jackie O'Leary um, has had published a very nice study looking at various um, uh, immunosuppression agents uh, and their use to prevent uh, the risk of DSA formation. Looking at induction treatments, so here there's a lot of induction that we actually don't use. So Campath, uh, we don't use rituximab for induction or bertuzumab. But if you look here at ATG versus basiliximab, uh, in this study, study here by Bronco, you can see where um, this is DSA free freedom. So you can see where ATG um, has a significantly um, higher uh, rate of being DSA free than, than basiliximab. However, that carries with it the risk of infection, et cetera. So it's a balancing effect. Uh, if, there was no, uh, if there was no major um, long-term problems with, uh, with ATG, we'd be using ATG in everyone. But we have to balance the whole uh, patient. Um, and there are certain patients who are more at risk of developing DSAs than others. So for CNI, um, for CNI choice, um, again, these, these, some of these are, are quite old studies, um, and they're looking at cyclosporin, which we don't even use now. But from these, we know that tacrolimus is, um, has a much um, a lower risk of a DSA development than cyclosporin. And similarly, with, my, with uh, anti-metabolites, mycophenolate uh, versus azathioprine, um, the, the risk with mycophenolate is lower than uh, azathioprine of developing DSA. So what, does, um, what are the guidelines? So the guidelines, they're, very, they're a little bit vague. Um, but again, they reinforce what I've just said. So um, they recommend for the immunosuppression for transplantation that we should use a CNI and a anti-metabolite with or without steroids, which we're doing. So we use tacrolimus, we use mycophenolate, we use um, steroids in a certain population, but the majority of patients here in BC use steroid avoidance um, regimens. Um, then uh, they're suggesting tacrolimus as a CNI being used, mycophenolate as first line for an anti-metabolite, which we're doing. And they also caution the, um, the use of mTORs, which is in, the, in Canada, we use sirolimus. Um, it shouldn't be used until graft function is stabilized and there's good graft function. It shouldn't be used um, if there's been a recent acute rejection. Um, or, you know, if there's recent uh, surgery because of poor wound healing. Um, so looking at adherence. So when I talk about adherence, um, I talk about the patient, but I also am looking at how we modify people's immune suppression by various obstacles that come up. For example, viruses, neutropenia, um, and if the patient is not tolerating mycophenolate, if they're getting um, uh, mycophenolic, uh, or if they're, if they're getting colitis, for example, with the effect of a mycophenolate, et cetera. So we adjust medication, but the patient, if they're in a very um, stable setting, they sometimes miss doses as well. And that that's, is blind to us uh, sometimes. The most important thing is education. So pre-transplant education about adherence, during the, the perioperative time, adherence education is important, and post-transplant is very important. If we see that their TAC levels are dipping, um, and some patients are very clever, they will take their TAC levels around the time they do their, they will take their TAC doses around the time they do their, their TAC levels, and they're not taking them in between. So we might not capture non-adherence. Um, so it's really important about education. The most vulnerable time to non-adherence um, is in the transition period between um, adolescence and adulthood. 
Um, we have an ongoing study um, with CNTRP at the moment called the Positive Study, which is looking at this transition age group and looking at adherence in this age group. And uh, the centres here um, in, in Vancouver are taking part in that study, looking at people under the age of 25 and looking at their compliance um, during, during that period of transition. The results of that aren't out yet. Um, Early recognition of non-adherence, as I said, it, it can be picked up by the pharmacist, by their refills. They, there's no, they're, they're not picking up their refills in the still of meds, so why could this be? By the post-transplant nurses, all the time there, we see low tachromis levels and we call the patients and say, yeah, we're taking our meds. Um, or is there something that is causing them to have low levels? Um, or is there an interaction with other medication that they're taking or the on antibiotics that may lower the levels, etc.? These are all questions that need to be asked and they need to be adjusted rapidly so that they're not going long term with low levels. Um, there is a concept as well of once daily dosing for those people who are vulnerable to missing medication. Um, with this, um, the patient sh needs to have good kidney function. But we can do one steady dosing with uh, a longer acting type of trachomus called Avograph, which, which I'm sure you've all come across, um, and one dosing of antimetabolite. So our, one, uh, our antimetabolite that we can use once a day is azathioprine, but we're under study at the moment is the use of mycophenolate used once a day also. So that may be an option in the future to convert people to once a day. We have some patients on once a day azathioprine and long-acting tacrolimus for this reason. Um, the pharmacy monitoring on refills, tac levels, interpatient variability. Um, and we, we at all costs try to avoid underimmune suppression. If somebody has a replicating CMV or polyomavirus, we do reduce their immune suppression because that's been shown to reduce their virus. But when the virus disappears, we also increase up their um, antimetabolite again to a level that's appropriate for immune suppression. Um, because if we leave it at the lower level, then we're opening uh, these patients to developing donor-specific antibody. So various treatment options are available if people do develop DSA. Um, and uh, this is the, these therapies are mainly in, in the setting of uh, acute antibody mediated rejection. Um, initially, when somebody has been diagnosed with this, we immediately increase up their tacrolimus dose to, um, to a higher uh, therapeutic range. And their mycophenolate, we try and maximize um, their dose, as well as putting them on prednisone. Um, in the next slide, I'll show you the regimen we use for anti uh, acute antibody mediated re rejection here in BC, but we use intravenous immunoglobulin with plasmapheresis um, in order to remove um, circulating anti-HLA antibodies. We also use rituximab, which um, is an anti-CD uh, um, antibody. Rituximab, we don't use too much. Um, uh, we did in the past, but its validity is questionable. E Ecoluzumab is not available here, um, but uh, it has uh, some beneficial uh, effects and has been shown in other countries to have beneficial effects in certain settings. There are several new agents um, that are in clinical trials at the moment. Um, IDIS is a streptococcal immunoglobulin endopeptidase, which actually cleaves the anti-HLA antibody immunoglobulin. Um, and that's, you, that's been uh, trialed in chronic AMR and transplant chemopathy. Um, but again, it's just under trial at the moment. We, we had several talks in a recent uh, conference we were at in Chicago uh, looking at the res some of the preliminary results on this. Another agent is a monoclonal antibody to IL-6 receptor. And IL-6 is intimately involved with um, the release of immunoglobulin from B cells. Um, and um, so at this level, at this level here, so um, that um, has promise as well uh, in the future, but again, under clinical trial. So what do we do here in BC? If somebody develops acute antibody mediated rejection, um, this here is time. So day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So we suspect rejection. So we pulse somebody. So they have their biopsy. It may take uh, up to 24 hours to get the result back from the biopsy. 
Um, and once we get the result back on the biopsy and it has the elements of antibody mediated rejection, so the histological elements, plus or minus C4D positivity, we also want to see if, if and how much uh, DSA the patient has produced. So we send that to the immunology, immunology lab to um, quantify what is the DSA that they have, do they have DSA, and how, how aggressive is it. Um, so with that, then uh, we um, activate our management plan. So our, our management plan is eight courses of PLEX, with each PLEX followed by IVIG, 100 milligrams per kilogram, um, and usually by the third day, and sometimes it depends on if this runs over a weekend or whatever, but if we have a, a two-day gap in our PLEX, we'll give rituximab at the end of that PLEX um, so that it has time to, um, to, uh, to take effect before the next PLEX, as, it's, as some of it is removed with PLEX. So they complete a PLEX IVIG, and at the same time, they're on steroids, and we have increased up their mycophenolate and tocolomus. Um, at the end of that, of course, uh, also we're monitoring their kidney function, are they getting better? At the end of that, we um, will biopsy to see what's the difference between um, now and when we started off. And uh, a week or two later as well, we monitor their DSA to see have we improved things. With PLEX, sometimes there's a rebound in DSA from from um, DSAs that are, are not in the circulation but rebound after PLEX. So we usually wait a couple of days after PLEX before we repeat a DSA because we might falsely be told, uh, get a result that's low. So um, we came together over the last probably year um, provincially, both BC Children's Hospital, VGH, St. Paul's, um, we got our hematologists involved, um, we got other, other organ groups involved to try and come up with um, a protocol for antibody mediated rejection. And with, liter with extensive literature search, looking at other centers, what they're doing, this is what we came up with and we've used this many times now um, with good effect. However, antibody mediated rejection is not always as simple, it's not always just barn door antibody mediated rejection. Uh, rejection. Sometimes there's T cell rejection and it's, sometimes there's a lot of chronic features. So we may not um, get the result we, we want at the very end, but certainly um, this is a good starting point and we hope to make protocols for more complex cases over the next, uh, over the next while as well. So what are our management choices? So we want to choose the optimal induction and maintenance immunosuppression for that patient. Um, the induction may differ according to different patient and donor parameters, um, but um, we have come up with a good starting point for our induction and maintenance uh, treatments here. Our acute rejection rates are, on, are, are very good compared to five, ten years ago. We want to manage, uh, we want to maintain therapeutic to chronomous levels, so we want to avoid drug interactions, we want to improve adherence. Um, we want to be very diligent with that. Mycophenolate levels uh, we don't do, but the tacrolimus levels are a surrogate for non-adherence because if people are not taking their tacrolimus, they're probably not taking their mycophenolate as well. Um, we want to be very careful in changing our MMF dose. So MMF is the first um, anti-rejection medication we change when we're modifying for viruses or for neutropenia. But we need to um, be very aware of what do we do when that neutropenia is recovered and what do we do when the viruses um, have gone away. We need to change our immune suppression again to levels that are therapeutic. Um, we want to ver be very careful in using uh, mTOR, so serolimus. So um, we, we are using serolimus in certain, in certain situations. We use it for... Um, uh, when people have uh, documented um, uh, skin cancers and recurrent skin cancers, uh, we change over, but we have certain criteria to change that over. We also use it um, for very resistant BK nephropathy um, as well. But again, we need to be very careful in doing that and we need to assess uh, the whole situation. The concept of routine DSA monitoring um, in settings of change in immunosuppression is something that we are talking about. 
it's, it has a huge effect on the immunology lab though, so it's something that we need to factor in when we're doing this. And it's probably not going to be a global thing, it's probably more in certain circumstances, but that's under discussion at the moment. Um, promoting adherence and, and, and reviewing their compliance as well, and this is more, more in keeping in the post-transplant clinic. Uh, we want to rapidly diagnose and treat antibody-mediated rejection. So when there is dysfunction, when we see the creatinine changing, we need to do a biopsy. We need to act on the biopsy results. You need to call the transplant centers immediately and we will advise you what to do. Um, so very briefly, I'm gonna talk about what do we do when things go past that and we're, we're getting nearer to as renal replacement therapy. We need to refer these people early for renal replacement therapy. Um, uh, John and I have both done a lot of uh, research on um, the failing graft and the complications other than mortality, but also on sepsis, et cetera, on these patients. And uh, they do require early referral because for early referral also, there is a um, anticipation that they might get a preemptive transplant. And if they can avoid that spike in mortality for initiating dialysis, that's huge. So um, the uh, early referral is crucial. So the benefit of repeat transplantation is shown in this study here. And I know it looks complicated, but this blue dotted line here is dialysis patients who are waitlisted um, after graft loss. So this is the risk of mortality in those patients, so a straight line. So at the time of transplant, mortality for a repeat transplant is also high, like in first transplant. So it is higher than those who are waiting for retransplant. But you can see that even faster than in the first transplant, that within a month, that uh, mortality rate goes lower than those who are waiting on the transplant for, or waiting on the waitlist for a transplant. Um, and long term, there's a huge long term survival benefit compared to waiting on the waitlist as well for retransplant. And um, I did work several years ago looking at the benefit of preemptive transplant. And I know that I don't want to steal David's thunder because I'm sure he's going to be talking about this later. But there is a, uh, there is a definite survival benefit as well of preemptive transplantation in these, in these failing grafts. Uh, it may be more difficult for them to get donors because their donor may have given them their first transplant. But it's certainly definitely worth uh, outreaching for, for living donors for these patients with that survival advantage. So in summary, so kidney transplant is successful and I don't want you to walk away from here thinking, oh, everyone's gonna fail and what am I gonna do? No, it's successful. These are only a small proportion of patients that are very unique that we need to be mindful of. Um, and they have an increased risk of mortality. We need to, uh, and we need to look after, after these because the number is growing as the patients Get more and more patients get transplanted, and people are surviving with their transplant. And we know that well over 50% of patients, um, their, delay, their death sensor graft loss or loss of the graft is caused by immunological reasons. The key to management is prevention. Don't let these people get donor-specific antibodies. Um, so we can do that by optimi using optimal immunosuppression, both at the time of transplant and right through their functioning transplant. We want to promote adherence, and we want to rapidly detect and treat any rejection that they get. So early an early referral for retransplant. It's important to remember also, um, and I think Abid will talk or will talk about it in the next talk. But like 38% of these people die with a functioning graft, so that's really important as well. So it's, this is well out of the scope of my talk, but it's important that these people also get ongoing cardiovascular uh, comorbid uh, treatment of their conditions as well to avoid that um, uh, to avoid that death with the functioning graft. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll take any questions. I think maybe we'll hold questions um, uh, until uh, Habib does his talk. I'll do my talk, and then we'll the three of us can uh, answer questions together. I'll, I'll uh, trim a little time because Owen did did take a little bit of my uh, my talk, which is good because uh, since I've already used her slides, uh, we won't have to. Uh, I won't bore you with seeing them again. So uh, our next speaker is Habib Mawad, and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Habib.
Many of you probably don't know him. He, 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 he's a quiet guy, but he, he's, a, 